I have read that one of the greatest theologians of the last century said when he was asked, what's the deepest truth you know? And he said, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So that's a great, great place to start. Grab your Bible and see what else the Bible has to say to you this morning as we look at Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We are in a mess as a country. We talked about that last week. We're in a mess. And so what do we do about it? Well, if we could bring enough people to Jesus, it would change things. I mean, isn't that the case? If enough people came to Christ and left their old ways behind and started living for the Lord Jesus, what a difference it would make in our country. So how in the world is that going to happen? Well, that's go- it just doesn't, boom, magically happen like that. It happens when God's people do what God said. God said, go therefore and make disciples. And so we've got to go out and find people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and bring them to Jesus. Now, that's why we're having this emphasis. Who's your one. We're trying to get everybody in our church to have at least one person that they love and they help and they serve and they pray for and ultimately they help to bring them to Jesus Christ. So that's what we're wanting to do. And we're not the only church doing that. All over the United States, our sister Baptist churches are doing that. And if all of us would do that, what a difference it would make in this country. Listen, on any uh, Sunday morning, Average, about 5 million people show up at Southern Baptist churches. And certainly we're not the only denomination or group in the country that loves Jesus. But about 5 million show up. If all those 5 million in one year brought another person, at the end of the year there would be 10 million. Do that again, it's 20, goes up to 40, goes up to 80, 160, 320 million. And in six years, everybody in the United States knows Christ. Doesn't seem too hard. Here's the problem. There's some people out there who it's going to take longer than one year. I mean, they are antagonistic. They are mad. They are mad at God. They're mad at churches, whatever, or they just don't believe any of that. And so it may take longer than a year for them. Also, here's another problem. A whole lot of us. Now, listen, I hate to say this, but it's true. It's true of me some days. Too many of us really don't care. We walk by people, they're on their way to an eternity without God, and a lot of times we just don't really care because we're all wrapped up in our stuff and what we want to do, and, you know, what are the Red Raiders doing tonight? We're all wrapped up in all that instead of the eternity of people. And then another problem is this, is that we say, I don't really know how to do that. Pastor, I I would like... To bring somebody with me to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to some, have somebody walking down the streets of heaven with me someday that I helped come to Christ. But I'm not sure how to do it. Well, this morning in Mark chapter 2, we're going to learn some things, hopefully, that will help us. So hopefully every person in this room, we are trying to find that person we're zeroing in on. Maybe somebody we work with. Maybe somebody in our family. Maybe a next door neighbor. Whatever. And that's going to be our one. And we want God to put that upon our heart. After that, what do we do? So we're going to read Mark 2. About four men that brought a friend to Christ. We're going to see how they did it. And then take that as application for our own lives. Mark chapter 2. When he, Jesus, had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. So he had come back, this was his home base, and he was there. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get in, to get to him because of the crowd... They removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
And immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and take your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet, went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Isn't that an incredible story? Now, what's going on here? Jesus was back in his hometown, his home base. He goes out. He had already been doing all kinds of miracles and preaching and teaching, going around. He comes back to his home base. Four men who had heard and maybe they had seen Jesus do some incredible things said, we've got a friend. There's this guy we know. We pass by him every day, and he's paralyzed, and that is a horrible situation. There were no government programs. There were no wheelchairs. There were no ADA accessibility. I mean, the only way he had to make a living was to beg. And so it was horrible. So they said, let's bring him to Jesus. So they picked him up. Four of them evidently got the corner of the blanket or the pallet or whatever it was, and they carried him to Jesus. When they got to the house, though, it was so full they couldn't get in. Man, I wish it would be like that around here every Sunday. But it was so full, they, they couldn't get him in. And so they, one of them, somebody said, I've got a plan. Let's go up on the roof. Now, in those days, the, the houses were sort of square, and they had flat roofs. And they would take timbers across, and they would put branches over that. And then on top of that, they would put this sort of clay that would harden, and it would be like a brick. And so it would have almost like a, a solid top. And they would use that for a patio area or for a sunroof or something. And... And they would have stairs outside their house to get up to it. And so they said, let's go up on the roof. Let's dig through the roof. Let's lower him down to Jesus. And everybody said, that's a great idea. So they went up there and they began to do it. And here's Jesus. He's teaching. And then all of a sudden these guys are digging up above him. Dirt's falling. You know, the branches are drooping down. And, and then here comes this guy lowered. And Jesus looked at him. Now listen, this guy's paralyzed. But Jesus looks at him and says... Your sins are forgiven. Folks, you understand what our biggest problem is? It's not our bodies. It's our hearts. It's our sin problem. That's our biggest problem. Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven you. Now everybody goes, what is he saying? Only God can forgive sins. Exactly. And Jesus is God. And he said, but so you'll know that I have authority. I mean, what's easier to say to him? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. And he said, I want you to know. So he said to the man, get up, take your pallet and go. And that's exactly what he did. And the Bible said they glorified God. They were stunned. They were amazed. And they said, we've never seen anything like this. Four men brought their friend to Jesus. We can learn from them. What can we learn? What's it going to take for us to bring somebody to Jesus? Hopefully you've got your one or two or three. I'm, I'm not going to say you can't have two or three, okay? But hopefully everybody's got their one. What are we going to do? What's it going to take? First of all, it's going to take conviction. It's going to take conviction. We've got to be convinced in our minds it really will help if we get this man to Jesus. These guys were convicted. They knew. They, they, they were convinced. They said, we, if we get him there, Jesus could do something. Maybe they've seen him help other people or they've heard about it or whatever. And in their hearts there was faith. And they come, and in verse 5 it says, Jesus, seeing their faith, they believed with all their hearts Jesus could do something about it. That's why they were so, went to so much trouble and effort to get that man to Jesus, they believed something could happen, and Jesus saw their faith, their conviction. And folks, for us to be able to bring people to Jesus Christ, we've got to be convinced in our heart it's going to make a difference. If you're not convinced in your heart it's going to make a difference, you're not going to do anything about it. 
Why should I go to that much trouble and stick my neck out when it may not even make any difference? But folks, when people really come to Jesus Christ, it really does make a difference. In my first year of college, I had been a rebellious prodigal son. I got sick of that. One night I rolled over in my college dorm room bed and I just said to Jesus, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of fighting. I want to do, I'm going to do what you say. I surrender. And I mean, my life changed. It was like black and white went to color. I mean, my life changed. And from that, I had this conviction that Jesus can change people. He changed my life. And that's part of my call to the ministry. I wanted to help other people come to know Jesus Christ so their lives can be changed. I was miserable, and all of a sudden, I wasn't miserable anymore. And I wanted other people to have that experience. I had conviction that if we get people to Jesus Christ, he could help them. Now, if you don't have that conviction, folks, something needs to happen in your heart. If you just think, oh, you know, Jesus is kind of okay, if that's the depth of your conviction, something needs to happen in your heart. You should know in your heart, because it has happened in your life, Jesus can change people. And he doesn't always change it in some big, huge, overnight experience like Saul on the Damascus Road. But if your life's never been changed, something's wrong. You need to have that conviction. Jesus can do it. We need conviction. Second, we need compassion. Now, that word is not spoken in this text, but it's written all over the text. These men cared about their friend. That's why they would go to so much effort. I mean, have you ever tried to carry somebody? It's not all that easy. So they all grab a corner of the blanket, and it's kind of hard to hang on to it, and they go across town, and they get to the house, and it's full. And they didn't say, well, it's full. Let's go home. No, they cared so much about him, they had this conviction, and they had compassion, and they said, we care, we want this man to be healed. Jesus can do it. So they said, what else can we do? So they carry him up on the roof. That's not easy. And they get up there, and they say, what do we do now? Well, we're going to dig through this clay. And uh, I don't know what they used or whatever, but they all went to work, and they dug. And Can you imagine the people down there at the bottom? having this happen, but they did it because they cared. Now, folks, listen, here's where it breaks down for us many, many times. And I'm talking to me as well as you. We go into that convenience store, and we're in a hurry, and we get our Coke or whatever, or whatever we need, and we leave, and we walk right past that person behind the counter, that clerk, and we don't even bother to look at them in the eye or whatever. They're just something, somebody that we use to get us out. Instead of having compassion in our heart and saying, you know, this person is a person made in the image of God. Jesus loved. Jesus died for this person. I wonder which way they're headed. Having some compassion in our heart. Now, we are all so busy. I mean, we're all doing our other things. And we've got our grass to mow. And we've got our house to clean. And our jobs to do. And our families to take care of. We're all incredibly busy. And sometimes our compassion once it gets past our spouse and our kids and our grandkids, it gets kind of thin out there on the edges. But we need to ask God, Lord God, grow our hearts. Give me some compassion and some care about that person whose eternity is at stake. And I don't even care. I'm so busy, wrapped up in my hobbies. I don't have time to worry about that person's soul. We need to ask God. And this something needs to happen perhaps even this morning. Lord God. Increase my heart, grow my heart so I care about somebody else. Nobody's ever going to come to Jesus if we don't care about them. Conviction, compassion, courage. It takes a little bit of courage to defy convention. To say, there's no other way to get this man to Jesus. We're going to have to dig through the roof. Do you understand you don't dig through people's roofs? <laughs> we don't do that. Can you imagine 
that you were having a dinner party at your house and you had invited Chuck Swindoll or David Jeremiah or some, you know, famous Christian and they'd come over to have dinner with you and you've invited a lot of your friends and the house is full and somebody else wants to be there and they can't get in. So they just go up on the top of your house and mainly you hear mm, chainsaws start up there and all of a sudden somebody's coming through your roof. Well, folks, it was exactly that same kind of thing. They were going through the roof. Because they had the courage to defy the social conventions. You don't dig through people's roofs. But when somebody needed to get to Jesus, they had the courage to overcome those conventions. Sometimes, listen, we have that little saying, well, you don't talk about religion and politics. Well, in our day, we started talking about politics. We have whole radio networks devoted to that, but... We need to talk not just about religion, but about a relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to learn to step over the line. Now, sometimes that's hard because we know where that line is and we're a little intimidated to step over it. But sometimes we need to. Sometimes we need to defy social convention. When I was pastor in Brownwood, one of our senior adult ladies' class were having a party. I think it was a Christmas party. I don't remember. They were having a little party, and they invited me to come over, and I was happy to. I love those ladies, and I was happy to go over and spend a few moments with them. So I, I turned down that street, and I saw all these cars in front of this house, and I just assumed, you know, this is the house. And so I pulled over there, and I went walking up to the door, and it was one of those big glass doors, and I could see all those ladies in there. So I just opened the door, and I just walked right in, not in the middle of them. And I stood there. I didn't know one of them. <laughs> And they all looked at me like, who are you? You know, social convention would have said you ring the doorbell, you knock on the door. But since it was a Sunday school party, I didn't need to do that. I just walked right in. Now, fortunately, I told them who I was. We had a high old time and just loved each other. You know, probably got a cookie out of that deal or something. But social convention is you knock on the door, you ring the doorbell before you go barging in. But listen, if I would have been driving by... And I would have seen smoke billowing out of that house. And I would have seen some tongues of flames licking at the roof. I would have stopped and I would have ran up to that door and I would have banged on that door and rang that doorbell. And if nobody would have come, regardless of what the social conviction or the social convention is, I would have got in that house. I would have knocked that door down if I could. My tiny little self. I would have tried to kick that door down so I could get in. There may be somebody here. There may be a child. There may be a senior adult in here. They can't get out. I, we're going to defy social conviction. We're going to get in. We're going to have courage. Sometimes it takes that in our Christian lives too. We have people and their lives are on fire. They're in a mess. They have no meaning, no purpose. They're not going anywhere in life. They're thinking about suicide. And we just kind of walk on by and say, well, I don't want to say too much, you know. Sometimes we have to ask God for the courage to step over that line. And we're talking to somebody. They're telling us all their problems. And, and we get to that place where we say, you know what? There was a time in my life where Jesus really touched me and changed my heart. Can I tell you about that? And they may say no. But at least you're trying because God has given you the courage. Conviction. I really believe this will help. Compassion. I care about this person. Courage. I'm willing to maybe go beyond where I would normally go. And finally, cooperation. What's it going to take to get people to Christ? Cooperation. Notice what it says here. Four men. Verse 3. Four men carried him. It's hard for one man. Maybe one man could have done it, but it was a whole lot easier when four of them picked him up on that stretcher, that blanket, and carried him across town and up those stairs and lowered him down through the roof. It was easier when four worked together. And the Bible says Jesus seeing their faith, plural. They were working together, cooperating. Do you know very seldom does somebody come to Christ after just one effort of some person? 
after just one little attempt to share Christ. Very seldom does that happen. What usually happens is a whole lot of people make a touch on a person's life, and finally they get to the place, because God is working, they get to the place where they say yes. Let me give you an example of how it works. Let's say that there's a young lady, and she's mad at God, mad at the world, mad at her family, and she's pregnant, and she's not married, and so she runs away from her home, and she's living out here and just living her life. And her mother begins to pray for her and the little girl, the the grandchild, because this girl's got a child. Grandmother's praying. Well, grandmother prays and prays and prays. And one day it dawns to the daughter, you know what? I could get some free babysitting. If When I was growing up, my mother always took me to church, and they would take care of me. So if I take my little daughter to church, they'll take care of her. My neighbor said she'll take her. If I let her go, I'll have a couple hours to myself to do whatever I need to do. That'll be great. So the lady says to her neighbor, you said you would take my daughter to church in Sunday school. You want to take her? Yes, I do. So she takes her. The little girl, grandmother's praying. Little girl gets to church, and Sunday school teaches her. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And the little girl hears that, and it registers in her mind and in her heart. And then in a few years, she keeps on going to Sunday school, and then she hears about vacation Bible school. And she goes home and tells mom, you know, mom, they're having vacation Bible school, and I want to go. And so mom says, hey, that's fine, free babysitting, you know, Monday through Thursday night, that'd be great. And you go. And so she lets her go, and her teacher at Vacation Bible School tells her, Jesus loves you. Jesus cares. Jesus died on a cross for you and rose from the dead. And the little girl hears that, and it's bouncing around in her mind. Then she comes to Fall Festival, and while she's here, somebody says, you know what? Jesus loves you. And then she's in junior high, and she goes to a a D now, and maybe she does it again in high school. And then she graduates, and she goes to college, and she's at college. And, boy, she thinks, man, I can really live it up now because I've gone to college. But a roommate come, I mean, her uh, next-door neighbor comes over and talks to her someday and says, you know what? I found Jesus Christ, and it's the greatest thing in my life, and I want to tell you about it. Now, I don't know that I want to hear about that. Well, if you ever do, I'm here for you. And, by the way, I'm... I'm going to church Sunday. Would you, would you go with me? Well, I'll think about it. But maybe because grandmother's praying, maybe she wakes up Sunday morning and says, you know what, I'll go with you. So she goes to church, and then at church, some people are singing music about Jesus loves you. And the preacher gets up, and he talks about Jesus. And the girl goes home. She gets on the Internet. She's looking up some stuff about Jesus. Some of it's bad, some of it's good, but she's looking it up. And then the girl next door comes over again and says, you know, can we talk now? And she said, well, you know what, I think so. I've got some questions, and could you answer those questions? And, and the girl tries to answer the questions for the other girl. And then later on, sometime that week, that girl's in her dorm room, and life's caving in on her, and she's been hearing about Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and One day she says, Lord Jesus, I don't know very much about you, but I sure need something. And would you come into my life? Now listen, who led that little girl to Jesus? Well, her grandmother, because her grandmother prayed. The Sunday school teacher, because the Sunday school teacher taught her. The vacation Bible school teacher taught her about Jesus. The preacher who preached the message, the music people who sang about Jesus, the girl in the dorm that lived next door, the person who wrote the article on the internet, all of that went together and all of that brought that girl to Jesus Christ. It was cooperation. Folks, we all need to be cooperative too. We all need to have our one, and then we need to be cooperative about all these others. When you hear about somebody and they need Jesus, you pray for them. And you're the teacher of that little girl's Sunday school class. And you work in vacation Bible school. And you sing in the choir about Jesus. And I preach about it. And you 
you're loving and nice to people today when we're all having a hamburger together. We are all working together. And by the way, you're also giving. And when you give, all these missions that we're supporting that are out in the commons, we pray for them, we give, we help. When you give and you help, you're helping to bring people to Jesus Christ. It's not just one person or two or four like in the story. Sometimes it's a whole lot of people working together. You saw those baptisms while ago. Folks, you had a part of that. You gave the money that financed the college ministry. A lot of those were college kids. You gave the money that financed that. That's not all you need to do, but that's part of what you need to do because we all work together to bring people to Jesus Christ. So what's it take? Conviction. I've got to believe it's going to help. Compassion. I've got to care. Courage. I've got to be willing to step over the line. Cooperation. I've got to be willing to work with these other people. And when that happens, and when that person comes to Jesus Christ, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Oh, and by the way, if you need to be healed, well, I can do that too. No big deal for me. And that person is changed. Look what happens. Sins are forgiven. Bodies are healed. God is glorified. And people are amazed. And they say, we've never seen anything like that before. That guy was on drugs. God got him off. Turned him around. Now he's doing great. He's walking straight. He's got a job. Man, I've never seen that happen before. That's what we want to see, folks. Some things we've never seen before. But God can still do. Jesus is God. He can still do it. And He invites us to be part of it. So who's your one? Who's your one? And what changes need to happen in all of our lives... So we will do our part. Would you bow with me in prayer please? As you bow. Here's what I need you to think about. Number one. Who, who is my one? Who is my one? Who do I care about? Who am I going to pray for and love and help and serve and minister to and Ultimately, try to bring them to Jesus Christ because that's the best thing in the world. Who is my one? And if God hasn't put somebody upon your heart yet, would you please ask him this morning? Lord, who is it? Is it a family member? Is it somebody I work with? Somebody I go to school with? Somebody that uh, I see at the family reunion? Somebody that lives next door? Somebody I play golf with? Who is my one? And then here's the second question. What needs to change in me? Now we're talking about other people getting saved and coming to Jesus and being changed. But what needs to change in me? Do I really have the conviction that Jesus Christ can change people? If you do not, that needs to change. Do I have compassion? Do I really care about anybody other than my family? If we don't, that needs to change. We need to change. Do I have any courage? Am I willing to ever step across that line? Now, we all want to be sensitive, and, but sometimes we just need to take that courageous step. Do you need to pray? Lord God, give me boldness. Give me courage. Your spirit lives in me. I can do this because you tell me to. Do we need to be cooperative? I don't have to do it all by myself. I can join with other people. I can take my part of the plan. Do I need to be cooperative? Do I need to be teaching at children's Sunday school? Do I need to work at vacation Bible school? So, Lord God, change me so that other people can be changed. And we'll see more and more and more and more people coming.
to the Lord Jesus. And people will be amazed. Father, thank you for a beautiful passage of Scripture. Thank you for that story. A true story. Thank you for it. Thank you for the four men who came bringing their friend. Thank you for the friend whose wife was turned around. Thank you for the lesson that it teaches us. So, Lord, we pray for ourselves, all of us, to have at least one person on our heart and mind. All of us be making an effort. But, Lord, all of us who need to be changed. Lord, help us. Help us to be the people who will be your evangelist in a dark world. And we ask for that in Jesus' name.